thank you all so much for being here and, and to our panelists, thank you again for uh, delivering this, this valuable presentation for us. I'll go ahead and stop share and then um, Kelly, you can, you can do your screen share. Perfect. Should be good to go. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Sarah Hogan. I am a division director of the Crisis Collaborative here in San Antonio. Um, we are a, the Southwest Texas Crisis Collaborative is a division of the Regional Advisory Council um, that actually um, it covers 22 counties. Um, there are regional advisory councils all over uh, the state of Texas. There's 22 of them. And um, I'm actually the uh, licensed mental health professional on the team here that is, oversees all of the behavioral health work that we're doing um, as a part of the, the division. But um, the racks at their core are really designed and are designated by the state to oversee and coordinate um, acute healthcare systems as well as emergency and disaster response efforts. And so you can see on the slide, um, we cover quite a bit of area here in Southwest Texas, uh, 26,000 square miles with 22 counties, um, over 2.4 million people involved in that. Um, our, our member agencies consist of um, 71 EMS agencies, four air, air medical providers, uh, 63 hospitals, um, two level one trauma centers, <clears throat> 16 cardiac centers, as well as 17 stroke centers. Um, we are considered to be a public health authority. And um, the most recent ad, and something that I'm really excited to talk to you about today, is um, uh, the behavioral health component of the RAC uh, here in San Antonio. Um, <clears throat> so lots of things were happening in our region, in our area. Um, dating back to around the 2015 timeframe that um, encouraged the RAC to become involved in uh, behavioral health. Um, so I'll jump right into some of the research um, and then we will go into some of the program development that uh, was able to come from that. Uh, the first uh, study that was happening, you can go to the next slide, Kelly, um, was that we noticed in our local ERs that we were having a very high volume of emergency detentions happen. Um, so we had individuals in a mental health crisis um, being emergency detained and transported, transported by police to um, our local ERs um, when really these individuals um, were medically stable and in need of um, psychiatric treatment. Um, it's probably not news to anyone on this uh, webinar today that the ER is really not the best place for somebody that's experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, <clears throat> and it's really a nationwide issue, not just a San Antonio or a Texas issue. Um, so that was one thing that was happening that um, was obviously a concerning volume. Um, there was over 9,000 that we saw just in one year, and that has continued to grow over the years. Um, at the same time, uh, or, or, or a little shortly after our, our Haven for Hope campus, which is a very large homeless shelter in San Antonio that offers wonderful resources for people experiencing homelessness um, to help them get back on their feet, was actually our um, number one 911 call spot. So I think we, in one year, we had over a thousand 911 calls that were happening to that location. Um, Trinity University um, actually did a uh, study with their graduate students to take a look into um, not only the call volume that was happening there, but the resources that were available um, and some of the, the gaps or integration needs that, um, that our community should look into. So those, those two things were happening. Um, and then uh, right after that, we had um, worked with uh, Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute um, this, this analysis was um, actually supported by Methodist Healthcare Ministries to really take a deep dive into Bear County's uh, mental health system. And so uh, I don't know if you can see very well on the Zoom, but um, the right, the bottom right of this slide really depicts the picture of what Bear County uh, was in as far as mental health goes. So we had different pockets of things happening anywhere from uh, the hospital system to um, local mental health authority with the Center for Healthcare Services, um, EMS, uh, public safety and law enforcement, uh, Bear County, and as well as the jail system, uh, mental health providers, um, and just different uh, 
different agencies working in kind of their own area, but there was really no cross uh, communication or coordination across the system, specifically around individuals that were kind of the highest um, uh, utilizers of services. Um, and so it really gave us a, a glimpse into, okay, we have pockets of success or silos of, of success, but our system wasn't really operating uh, in the best way to, um, to care for individuals and, and uh, mental health uh, treatment needs. So we took that information um, and um, we worked towards trying to better understand um, not just you know, a small group, but truly the overall um, safety net population of San Antonio. And um, again, Methodist Healthcare Ministries supported this, uh, this research as well. Uh, where we utilize a data analytics team out of Houston called ha uh, Capital Healthcare Planning, who um, did a survey across our safety net population and then also went into um, kind of a, a deep dive of the intersect of uh, mental health, homelessness, and then high utilization um, and evaluated kind of the cost associated um, to that uh, population. And the results are going to come up on the next slide that really caught um, um, private funders' information or um, attention, philanthropy, um, as well as really our overall system. Uh, it kind of kind of told us what we what we already knew that we really need to put something in place um, as a system to make sure that we're taking care of um, individuals in our community. So you can see the safety net population, and this is just for one year. Um, of data and this is um, healthcare costs. Um, the safety net population was costing about $1.1 billion um, in healthcare costs. And then if we looked at mental health, um, homelessness, and high utilization, um, there was a very small group of individuals, about 3,500, um, that had over 62,000 encounters that uh, were um, costing about $175 million. Um, so I, I put this slide in here. Um, I think it's an important slide uh, because it really generated some movement around change in San Antonio and Bear County. Um, we um, knew that there was a problem. We knew that um, individuals in a mental health crisis do not belong in an ER. Um, they should be directed towards the uh, right level of care and the treatment that, that they need at the time. Um, we knew that individuals on our Haven for Hope campus um, we're also in need of, of care immediately, and maybe a 911 response um, wasn't always appropriate. Maybe they needed to connect it to ongoing outpatient care, or um, if you know going inpatient for mental health services was needed at the time, we would do that. Um, but this slide, this kind of got everybody's attention because there were all of a sudden numbers and costs associated um, to, to kind of help generate some movement around this work. Uh, next slide. Um, so these are our engaged systems so far. Um, I mentioned we are the crisis collaborative. STRAC is um, considered to be the backbone of the collaborative. We are not a provider. We actually work with all of these providers on the slide, um, including NAMI, who has continued to be the voice um, of individuals being served in the community and has really helped us create some great programming that you'll learn about today. Um, but you can see it's anywhere from uh, philanthropy with Methodist Healthcare Ministries to public safety with law enforcement um, and EMS, our local mental health authority, the Center for Healthcare Services, a very big part of what we're doing. Local health systems are on here, um, both uh, private and our, our county um, hospital. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a mixture of everyone as well as um, Haven for Hope and some homeless uh, providers. Um, Jack's kind of uh, uh, considered to be the execution arm of um, what really the, um, the community needs. And so our team is very, very small, and the providers that you see on the screen are the ones that um, do all the work. <clears throat> um, one of our first programs, so I'll jump right into that, um, that came from uh, the collaborative. I do want to mention that um, we are supported um, and funded by uh, many of those agencies that you just saw on the screen. Um, local health systems, uh, philanthropy with Methodist Healthcare Ministries, the city and the county actually fund pieces of this uh, work as well. And then um, our local mental health authority brings um, lots of the state resources and um, we're able to leverage that to really build a system to make sure that we're taking care of people. Um, this law enforcement navigation was our very first program and it's actually 
uh, near and dear to my heart because um, it was you know, a pilot and it was something that we started back in October of 2017. Um, so we just, wow, I'm saying that out loud, we just hit the, uh, <laughs> we just hit the third year on this program. And this is, um, was really set out to address those uh, numbers that I showed you at the beginning of the pre presentation around emergency detentions in local ERs. So um, we wanted to um, create a system that directed people to the right level of care from the beginning versus um, individuals having to go to an ER and then a weight transfer anywhere from nine to over 100 hours. Um, and so we started with um, our MedCom dispatch center, which is actually a 24-7 dispatch center that is housed within STRAC. It's a, um, it's a division of STRAC actually where um, we have been doing um, trauma transfers for over 20 years or so across uh, the Southwest Texas region, where if, if an individual is in need of a level one trauma service um, and they're in an outlying area or an outlying hospital, they are able to be um, directed into town to one of our, our two uh, trauma uh, hospitals. And so MedCom's been in the background. Um, we've had this in place, again, for over 20 years coordinating that work um, as, well as, as well as air medical support. And then um, we folded in the behavioral health component. Um, so the city of San Antonio actually gave our, um, our MedCom division access to all 911 calls that are related to mental health um, so that we all of a sudden had a view into um, the calls across the city um, on uh, what was going on mental health related. Um, so we use this foundation to be able to generate um, this new program. Um, so the next slide is going to show you. Um, we worked with all of our behavioral health providers, so anywhere from inpatient psychiatric providers to our local mental health authority um, that actually operates uh, an extended observation unit to give people some time to stabilize before going to the hospital or hopefully being able to, to be connected to outpatient care. Um, as well as general hospitals that have um, inpatient units as well. Uh, we worked with everybody that had that capability to be able to give us a, a status on their open beds. Um, and what, what we did was look at not just how many beds do you have, but in what category. So I'm not sure if you can see it on the slide, but we worked on um, creating categories for children, adolescent, even um, segregating by, that by age group. So under 12, 12 to 17, and then your adult category, um, 18 uh, to 64, and then um, your geriatric population. Um, so all of the uh, systems that you see on the screen are reporting in real time their bed availability. And MedCom, the dispatch center, is able to monitor that to see um, what we have open across the city when somebody um, goes into a mental health crisis and are in need of uh, uh, direction to care. Uh, the next slide gives you kind of a snapshot of how this looks. Um, again, we're working with our access to uh, 911 calls. We, uh, MedCom will uh, look into the computer-aided dispatch uh, software that we have available um, and, and really monitor to see is this original call going to turn into something like an emergency detention <clears throat> where the officer and, and, and the person being served uh, are in need of navigation uh, directly to psychiatric care. So they monitor the call. Um, if the emergency detention does occur, um, then law enforcement from the field will call MedCom for navigation. Um, MedCom will take a look at that screen that I just showed you to see um, who's open um, and who is closest um, to uh, the patient and the officer to be able to get them to care quickly. Um, and again, um, look, really looking at um, the patient, their age, um, we kind of take a look to see if there's um, any sort of level of aggression um, and making sure that we're taking care of the unique populations that um, need to be navigated. Um, we enter that information into a database here, and then uh, MedCom uh, provides the officer with a location to transport the individual. Um, the facility actually receives a uh, notification call from MedCom to let them know, hey, um, this officer's on the way with the patient. They'll be, in the, be there in about 15 to 20 minutes or so, um, so that they're able and, and ready to receive the person um, as quickly as possible. Um, this is just uh, some of the data, and I know it's a little bit of a busy slide, um, but I wanted to make sure that the numbers were included in here so you could kind of um, have an understanding of the volume. 
In 2019, so a full year of operation with law enforcement navigation, there were over 20,000 cases that were uh, tracked. And so that was all of our emergency detention cases. Um, so not only the ones that were navigated, but um, also the what we call in-hospital emergency detentions. Those are when, um, as a person walks in um, and are in, in looking for treatment and then end up um, needing an emergency detention, as well as individuals that may have come in um, on um, an overdose situation or they come in with um, a medical condition and then end up being transferred uh, for psychiatric treatment at the time. So we tracked everything through MedCom. We had over 20,000 cases and um, a little uh, close to 12,000 were um, navigations to a psychiatric facility. Uh, the left-hand side, you will see that um, we've had great success with this program as far as adoption goes with law enforcement. Um, the LE self-navigated 1% actually means that and that's when an officer did not call MedCom for navigation in one of these situations. Um, again, it's only 1%, uh, 204. Um, and then the next uh, percentage there is law enforcement to the magistrate or jail, um, which is very low, 104 there. Um, law enforcement to a general hospital. This might mean that the person may have a minor medical condition. They really needed to be evaluated first. Um, maybe didn't require an EMS uh, transport. There were 4% uh, that went into that category. EMS to a general hospital, um, that is, again, a, a medical patient, somebody that really needed to be um, medically cleared before they could go into psychiatric treatment. And then the canceled was um, calls that just didn't end up going through. <clears throat> and then this is just an update of that data. So far for the year of 2020, we've seen um, 16,700-ish uh, cases come through MedCom, and we've navigated um, close to 11,000 so far. So we're, we're um, uh, on track or just a little bit below the numbers that we saw in 2019, um, but actually we're seeing a higher percentage of navigation if you compare the total to the actual navigation total um, that we saw in 2019. And I'm going to hand it over to Kelly Burnham, a uh, program manager. Um, she's currently works on the stick team, and she has been um, kind of in charge and overseeing some of our multidisciplinary teams. Um, we do have a couple of guests on the call as well that um, Greg mentioned at the beginning, and we actually have um, a few deputies and an officer from some of the teams that actually um, do the work. So we're happy to have them on uh, for questions and to support Kelly as she kind of runs through some of these new teams that were developed. Yeah, so like Sarah mentioned, uh, we have three different uh, teams that we manage through the Crisis Collaborative that are uh, involving multiple different uh, organizations throughout the community. Uh, the one common organization that you'll see throughout all three of these programs is uh, the Center for Healthcare Services, who provides the uh, clinical guidance for the team. Um, and we've got clinicians on each one of those teams from the center. Um, and then we've got a combination of, of some kind of law enforcement and fire department uh, slash EMS type uh, partners as well on different programs. So we'll start uh, with the first one and then I'll introduce you as we get through uh, their programs to the officers that are on the phone. So we've got uh, Ramon Martinez and Robert Martinez here from the SMART team. So it's the first one I'm going to talk about. The SMART team stands for the Specialized Multidisciplinary Alternate Response Team. Uh, this is actually our newest law enforcement related crisis collaborative team um, that just launched in October. So we've just completed our second month, um, our first full month, but our second month in operation. Uh, so we've had a lot of lessons learned so far. We are still tweaking this program kind of as we go, um, but this is more of a response-based program. It includes uh, the Center for Healthcare Services, like I mentioned, a Bear County Sheriff's Office, Acadian Ambulance provides a paramedic, and then we've got uh, the county who actually funds the program through the Crisis Collaborative. The program goals uh, for the SMART team are to respond to low-level, non-violent mental health-related calls. And the idea being that we've got a, a licensed clinician as well as a paramedic who are the initial um, parts of the team that approach the mental health patient as long as we've gone through a dispatch process uh, that deems this to be low level and nonviolent. And then we've also got uh, the mental health unit part of the team, which are the deputies um, who also are there on the, t on the scene as well to really provide a, a safety role and then any kind of law enforcement function like emergency detentions or things like that that might need to happen. Um, but our goal being to effectively treat the patient using the least restrictive approach. So like I said, using that clinical team at the forefront 
and then the officers as needed. Um, we are hoping to increase the availability of patrol by doing this. So when we send the SMART team, we don't always send a patrol unit uh, as well. So we'll, we're hoping to free up some of those resources. And we are providing a warm handoff from that mental health clinician uh, to the next level of care if it's needed. So whether that's an emergency detention or the person goes voluntarily uh, to a facility, we've got a bunch of different options there, but that clinician does actually uh, follow the person to the hospital or to the facility so that they can give a warm handoff and kind of some context as to what was going on on that scene. And then we've got another part of the team uh, that's a non-response part of the SMART team that are also Center for Healthcare uh, Services employees that um, provides peer support and uh, some other mental health uh, type care management support after the fact. So this is after the response, they can be handed off to that part of the team. It's a little bit small uh, for you to see, but this is some of these are some of the questions that the dispatchers uh, ask the caller in the very beginning to help determine whether this is a low-level, uh, nonviolent type call. So um, someone calls either 911 or calls into the non-emergency line that goes to the sheriff's office. Uh, and says that they're requesting mental health services, this is a, the line of questioning that they would go through. So is it mental health related? Um, are there any indications that the person is violent? If there's any criminal activity, uh, any weapons on the scene, any threats to life helps us rule out whether or not we need to send an ambulance, uh, and then any injuries and medical, same thing. Uh, so if they meet all of these uh, correct questions and they answer them all in the, in the right way, that would allow the team to go out, then the SMART team responds instead of patrol. And this is kind of the workflow of what I just spoke to you about. So the call comes into Bear County Sheriff's Office. Uh, patrol will go to all law enforcement emergencies to include mental health calls if there's violence or weapons on the scene. Uh, if there are not and it meets the right requirements, then the SMART team will go. Um, patrol always does have the option of calling the SMART team if they get onto the scene and are able to secure it and we can assure that the team's uh, going to be safe, then they can definitely call for the SMART team. Uh, so SMART could be involved either way uh, once patrol gets on the scene. SMART gets on scene, uh, their job is to de-escalate and then navigate that patient appropriately. So that could be anywhere from providing some social needs, uh, such as maybe a, a courtesy ride to Haven for Hope, which is our, our homeless shelter downtown, like Sarah mentioned earlier. Um, it could be anywhere from connecting them to outpatient services, so maybe that's a connection uh, to one of the other teams that I'll talk about here in a second. Maybe that's uh, de-escalating them and, and all they needed was maybe somebody to talk to and then we can follow up with a different team or maybe the provider that they already have uh, within a few days. Or it could be more acute where they need to actually be emergency detained or they can go voluntary uh, to the psychiatric facility. We do still utilize uh, MedCom if they're going to go with one of those options. So if the person needs to go to a facility, whether it be under ED, uh, or voluntary, we are still using uh, MedCom so that we can be navigated and those facilities have a heads up. And then like I mentioned a minute ago, the clinician actually responds uh, with or, or doesn't respond, but will follow the patient over to that facility so that we can give that warm handoff. Uh, the facility can treat the patient and then contact MedCom on discharge. And then we've also got some things set up and in place uh, that can allow MedCom to alert the team and then the team can help uh, navigate that person into services. So maybe it was an emergency detention, they got stabilized at the facility and now they're ready for discharge. SMART can then follow up using their peer and their qualified mental health professional in order to connect them uh, to a team for outpatient services for ongoing. This is a little bit of our data. Like I mentioned, we actually started in October. October 5th was our first day that the team hit the road. Uh, they are on Monday through Friday from 2 to 10 right now. We are looking at possibly expanding uh, the coverage, but this was a, a real new initiative, so we're trying to learn just a little bit before we go into any kind of expansion. Uh, in their first almost full month, uh, they ran 45 calls for service and actually made it to the scene of 27 of them. That high number in cancels, it's important to keep in mind, uh, this, this team is in Bear County only. So we're not inside the city of San Antonio right now because it's a Bear County Sheriff's Office program. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't expand to inside the city coverage eventually, but they're, at this time, we're in um, Bear County only, which if you're familiar at all with, with San Antonio and Bear County, we're kind of in a donut. Um, Bear County surrounds the city of San Antonio, and so you can imagine that with one team being on the road, there's a little bit of an extended response time sometimes. 
Uh, so a lot of those cancels have to do with patrol maybe making the scene first and then realizing that smart's not needed or they diffuse the situation uh, in some other way and aren't able to, to hand it over to SMART. So uh, we are keeping a close eye on those. Of course, as we're able to expand our team, uh, we'll have more coverage that, that will help to decrease those response times. Uh, the number one reason for the problem nature uh, for the call that was coming in in October were welfare checks and then followed uh, by emergency detentions. Uh, so this was the officer getting on scene and then realizing that uh, somebody needed to be ED'd and then calling for SMART. And you can see the resolutions over here on the right-hand side. 11 of those uh, calls of the 27 that they made it onto the scene, they were able to resolve on the scene without actually transporting the person anywhere. Also in October, uh, we like to track the times that these calls come in to see when our busiest time is. We obviously want to make sure that we're utilizing our resources wisely and that we actually have a team on uh, when, when they should be on, when the highest number of calls are coming in. Uh, so Thursdays in October were the busiest, and then somewhere around 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, were also the busiest for the times of the day. And then our average response time over here of 22 minutes, and then an average on-scene time of 56 minutes. So the nice thing about the SMART team is not only that it's got multiple different components of a mental health professional as well as a medic uh, that can assess them medically and then the officers there for safety, but they also have the luxury of spending a little bit more time uh, with the patient rather than having to free up the resource to go to the next call, like your typical patrol officer or even an, an ambulance, um, they are able to spend a little bit more time talking with the patient and maybe de-escalating on scene. November uh, was just a little bit busier, so at 50 calls for service, they made it on scene to 29 of those calls. Uh, we're able to resolve 17 of them on scene. And then you can see our cancels are still up there at 17. And again, our number one reason um, was the extended response time. We started to track this in November because we had a feeling that that's probably what it was. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we were keeping an eye on that. And then our days of the week uh, and times of the day changed just slightly. Wednesdays were actually a little bit busier than Thursdays throughout the month of November. And then around five o'clock and seven o'clock. So you're still seeing that uh, end of the work day and then early evening uh, that's the highest. Our problem natures though by far were welfare checks uh, as the highest. And then you can see the response time was just slightly higher, um, but they're still spending about an hour on scene with these individuals. Uh, okay, so that is our SMART program. And the next program I'd like to touch on is the PIC program. This is the program for intensive care coordination. And we've got uh, an officer, Kylie Campbell, on here with us to represent the PIC program. She's actually assigned to the PIC team from the San Antonio Police Department. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the uh, common thread with all these programs are the clinicians from the Center for Healthcare Services. This program involves the San Antonio Fire Department, Mobile Integrated Healthcare Paramedics, as well as the San Antonio Police Department Mental Health Unit uh, officers. <clears throat> This team's goals are a little bit different. So they get, they're not so much of a response team. They're actually more of a follow-up team. And so the way that you get on a pick list here in our uh, community is that we track number of emergency detentions through law enforcement navigation that Sarah talked about earlier. And if you have a certain number of emergency detentions or we notice that you're increasing quickly on your number of emergency detentions, or your use of what we call the PEZ facility here, which is a psychiatric emergency service center um, that can provide like a temporary stabilization unit for these patients, then we can add you to the pick list. And this is intensive case management with your, your care manager from the Center for Healthcare Services, your uh, police officer that's assigned to the mental health unit and to pick, um, and then your MIH medic, which can do all kinds of different um, welfare checks and, and medical checks, med compliance, things like that. Uh, so there's a, a really well-rounded team that can provide a lot of different resources and some really extensive resources to these individuals in order to get them uh, into outpatient services and then keep them compliant. Um, and really there's just a plethora of things that, that this team does uh, to help these, these individuals get back on their feet. So whether that's connecting them to social resources, um, anything that they really need to become less dependent on the crisis services and more um, independent and in control of their own mental health. So like I mentioned a second ago, uh, this is the workflow for the PIC team. So your individual gets identified as having multiple emergency detentions or PED visits. 
Uh, they're then added to the pick list and assigned to a care manager. That pick list gets distributed to MedCom uh, and pretty widely to facilities. And the reason for that is that we like to be notified, the PIC team likes to be notified when this person pops up somewhere. So maybe that's coming through MedCom and they were uh, went through the law enforcement navigation program because of an ED. Or maybe that's that they popped up in your local emergency room um, and were asking for help. So they may not all come through the law enforcement navigation, which is why the facilities are also involved. But the PIC team is really the one constant in this person's life. Uh, so the PIC team gets notified if this person pops up at any of these facilities. We actually do, uh, just recently, we added an on-call service to PIC, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The PIC care manager uh, that's on-call can be notified of a PIC patient that pops up anywhere, uh, whether it be in a facility or come through an emergency detention to a facility. PIC, of course, uh, contacts that facility back and then can has a couple different options. So it may not be uh, that PIC is needed right away. This person may need a little bit of time to stabilize in a facility and then PIC can always follow up with them the next day. But, but what's important there is that PIC knows where they are and that they can rely on that care manager from the PIC team to get, then follow up um, with them. And so they, they really become reliant um, and, and depending on those PIC care managers that are really walking them through um, getting you know, things back under control. Uh, the individual is stable enough for PIC, then PIC can respond immediately. So we have that on-call uh, feature that they're able to go to the facilities as well. Um, moving past the MedCom facilities notification is the uh, PIC attempting to locate and engage the individual in services. So we don't wait for them to pop up in facilities, although that's really helpful sometimes in finding individuals um, that have been added to the PIC list. We also go out and do the research and find these people. Uh, so the sooner we can engage with them, even outside of the facility when they're not in crisis, the better options we usually have uh, to getting them into outpatient services and then we can decrease their crisis services. Uh, so PIC uh, finds the individual, attempts to engage them, gets their buy-in, uh, gets consent, and then they're now active with PIC, and then a needs assessment and a care plan is completed for this individual. <clears throat> so you can see in the pink box on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, the, some of the things that the in-field PIC care management um, team can do. What's really important about the PIC team versus any other team um, that you might be assigned to is that we do, a, a PIC does a lot of things in the field. So whether that's an intake uh, into the center that they need to get taken care of and the person refuses to come into the clinic, we'll make special arrangements to be able to make sure that that gets done um, at their house or, or wherever they're comfortable doing it. Maybe that's uh, walking them through pre-trial services because they've gotten involved with the mental health court. Or maybe it's things like uh, connecting them back with their family who they didn't think wanted to be around uh, anymore. Things like that that we pick really goes out of their way more than most care managers um, would in order to connect them back into services and get them stable and so that they ensure that they have all the right resources. A few barriers to pick uh, that we've learned over the past year and a half or so. Uh, substance use is a problem we've run into often. Um, it's, you know, we've got some resources uh, to deal with it. Of course, we could always use more resources in dealing with substance use, but getting the person to really commit to that has been a challenge. Uh, limited housing, some individuals that we run across with PIC are uh, homeless and some of them choose to not um, want to fix that. And so that's really been a challenge, not only in, in getting the patient services, but also in um, being able to locate them time and time again. Uh, job finding has been a challenge for PIC, so that's one of the things that a care manager can do is help get them connected uh, to some kind of a job location services or a temp agency, places like that. Uh, getting individuals to be consistent with medications and treatment, of course, this can always, you know, a lot of this kind of ties into each other, so maybe it's that there's substance use problems and uh, we're trying to get past that so that we can get them to actually show up and get their injection once a month or something along those lines. Uh, homelessness, we mentioned, um, IDD population and getting them connected into the right services and having the right uh, paperwork that needs to go with those services in order to get them the services can always be a challenge. Uh, veterans assistance type services, we, there's a lot of uh, paperwork and, and hurdles that have to go through, we have to go through as a PIC team 
uh, in order to get people their benefits, things like that. And then, of course, everyone's challenge, um, that's the latest and greatest challenge, is COVID-19, um, which obviously has played a big role um, in having to assess the patient and making sure that, that we're uh, keeping the team safe as well. So some future plans with PIC. Uh, we'd like to expand the team eventually. The more care managers that we have and the more officers and medics that we have, of course, the more people we can uh, provide these intensive services to. These, these patients tend to be on the PIC list for a while. It's long processes like benefits and housing and things like that um, that sometimes take some time in order to get people back up on their feet. Uh, continued addition of stakeholders, of course, we've got the support of the entire crisis collaborative, which is essential in having this be um, successful. We've got the PIC name is out there now. It's taken a little bit of time, um, but people know who the PIC team is, and, and when they show up at a facility, uh, usually they're pretty grateful to have them there because the PIC team is kind of, like I said, the one constant in the patient's lives. And then sustainability. So uh, learning what we can bill for and how we can continue to sustain uh, the PIC team and, and the finances, finances of the PIC team. We'll go through just a little bit of data real quick on the PIC team. Uh, these are emergency detentions for patients that were enrolled six to 12 months. We did this at our one year. Uh, so one year from our start, we had 90 total patients that had gone through uh, the PIC team. Prior, in the quarter prior to being on the PIC list, uh, these individuals had an average of 1.1 emergency detention per month. Uh, in the first quarter after being on PIC, they had decreased to 0.7 uh, EDs per month. In the second quarter to 0.6, and then the third quarter all the way down to 0.4. So we cut those ED, the average ED per month, uh, by half by interacting with them. And then another favorite way of us showing uh, kind of our PIC progress are patient vignettes. And so uh, we like to show a profile of, of pre-PIC and then all of the things that PIC did to connect this individual into services and the drastic drop of the emergency detentions and the PEDS visits that that sometimes can create. Um, so I'll go through a few of these. I think I've got three of them on here. Uh, this first gentleman was a 50-year-old male, uh, homeless, bipolar disorder, did not have an ID card, didn't have any benefits, was not on medications, did not have a doctor, did not have a psychiatrist um, or a job. He was an end-stage liver cirrhosis due to alcohol abuse along with some other medical concerns. And he had some se pretty severe safety concerns with going to Haven for Hope um, and had a couple bad experiences in the past that, that was not allowing him to go back there. Uh, so prior to PIC intervening with him, uh, he had had 15 PD contacts, and you can see the string of emergency detentions there uh, throughout. PIC's initial contact with him was uh, between July and August of 2019, so he was one of our original PIC consumers. Uh, he, we got him into a housing facility, a temporary housing facility. Uh, we attempted to get him on hospice, although we had some challenges with that because of not being funded and then also being homeless. Uh, he was kind of in and out of the hospital for medical problems, but not uh, so much for emergency detentions after PIC intervened. So you can see that he only had three EDs uh, post-PIC, and then it actually dropped off completely. But we were able to get him to finally agree to a different uh, homeless shelter, where he actually stayed for a little while and was able to get stable. Um, so we were able to get him in to get a primary care physician. Our PIC clinicians actually went with him to his uh, primary care physician appointment. We also got him in to see the psychiatrist that's connected to the PIC team, who he was also keeping up with seeing, um, applied for his ID, got him benefits, and then got him into uh, some transitional housing and out of the, sh the homeless shelter, and then actually got him some employment. Uh, and the EDs have dropped off since then. So you can see the, the intensive case management and the pushing forward through all of these different hurdles. Um, that normally caused setback after setback for the individual, the PIC team was really able to walk him through and have a successful story on the other side. All right, next patient profile is that early 20s uh, individual, major depressive disorder, was homeless, uh, transgender, did not have an ID, uh, was an IV drug user, no doctor, uh, had a temporary agency employment kind of off and on, um, was looking for some services through a primary care provider as well as a psychiatrist. 
uh, and no benefits, and also some legal uh, concerns. So you can see the EDs prior to PIC, um, and then involvement with PIC there between July and August of 2019, uh, the PIC, or the, I'm sorry, the emergency detentions almost completely dropped off. Uh, we were able to um, get this individual to agree to rehab, got them in some temporary housing, uh, got their citations dismissed because uh, the individual was working with the PIC team and we were actually having some success. So like I mentioned earlier, a lot of times our PIC uh, officers can help intervene in some of the pretrial uh, court related type things if the individual will agree to work with the PIC team. Uh, we actually got this person uh, the identification, got them some benefits, got them a good job. Uh, and again, the emergency detentions have all but dropped off. And the last uh, profile I'd like to run through real quick is a 27-year-old male, poly substance use, which means he was on a lot of different uh, types of substance use, had some medical conditions as well, uh, did not have any birth certificate or ID card, so he was unable to apply for benefits, um, and was grieving the loss of his mother and girlfriend, so going through some pretty traumatic times. Uh, you can see back there in November of 2018 uh, was when the suicide of his girlfriend happened and the EDs almost immediately started uh, right in there and then continued in a pretty um, consecutive manner. Initial PIC contact was in August of 2019, um, got him into a program at Haven for Hope, were able to get him in to see the psychiatrist with the PIC team. Um, <clears throat> the medical part of the PIC team, so our, our medics were able to, to hook him up with the medical supplies and then also uh, some clothing and things like that, and then also get him in to see a primary care doctor to get his ileostomy bag uh, redone, and then admitted into some transitional housing, obtained all of his identification, and they're actually, actually we're still interacting with him um, throughout this year. So some pretty big success stories um, and some pretty decent reduction in those emergency detentions that helped to free up some of the system. Our last program is uh, CCSI, which is the Chronic Crisis Stabilization Initiative. This is a program, again, with the Center for Healthcare Services. Uh, there's a couple of licensed clinicians, as well as a qualified mental health professional who's a care manager. Uh, the San Antonio Police Department Mental Health Unit and then uh, Department of Human Services through the city is actually the funding uh, resource through this. <clears throat> the program goals for this uh, program are a little bit different as from the other two. They actually do some more follow-up um, and connection to outpatient services, but on a quicker turnaround, and also on people that are utilizing uh, 911 over and over again, as well as threats, big um, threats to the public. And so we'll walk you through some of the ways that somebody might get on a threat um, assessment group and then be staffed and, and handed off to the team. Um, but their goal is to provide some on-scene crisis stabilization and then also connecting them into outpatient resources, um, whatever they need so that they can get to a team that can then take on the care management part of their um, getting them to not rely on crisis services. This is the workflow for CCSI. So the individual is identified as being a threat to the public. This could be uh, social media type outcries. This could be someone um, alerting the police department that somebody's making uh, comments or threats, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so a couple different ways you could get on the threat team. Uh, and then also could be an individual identified by being a crisis services high utilizer. So that may be um, someone that's calling 911 over and over again and asking for a police officer, something along those lines. Uh, the individual gets added to the CCSI list for assessment or intervention. And then the licensed clinician and the mental health unit officer are a team. Uh, so we've got two teams of the, that combination that go out um, and locate these individuals and attempt to engage them. They have a couple of different roles on scene. So the mental health unit officer is there uh, to help determine the level of threat that the individual is providing and then also to keep the scene safe. Uh, and then the licensed clinician is evaluating the need for mental health or social needs. If they determine that this person is a mental health related uh, patient and that they need some social needs, we can connect them to a secondary part of the team, which is the qualified mental health professional or a care manager uh, who can then assess them and link them into services. So our, our goal is for that uh, care manager to connect this person into a team um, and get them handed off rather quickly 
But while they're doing that, they're going to address the immediate needs like medication stability, um, maybe getting the ID recovery process started, uh, any kind of emergency shelter type situations or food insecurities. So getting them stabilized immediately and then handing them off to another team, um, whether that be with the Center for Healthcare Services or maybe that's a private doctor that they were already seeing, um, but ensuring that they've got some kind of a reliable team that they can depend on. Uh, they also have a couple of other options on scene. Uh, if it's a threat-related uh, individual that doesn't need uh, ongoing care management, they get put in these threat level buckets, um, so low, moderate, elevated, high, or potential imminent. Um, and your level of threat depends on how often MHU uh, and the CCSI clinician are going to keep checking up on you. That can change at any time, so that people can kind of fluctuate within this threat level. Um, and of course, if there is a mental health um, portion, then they can be referred on uh, to be connected to outpatient services as well. And then there's always the option of the individual uh, needs are met and resolved on scene. Um, maybe the case was unfounded, uh, and then the individual is left um, to maybe follow up with their doctor. A few barriers to CCSI, just like with our other programs, substance use, uh, limited housing, of course, finding jobs and employment, um, people being consistent with medication and treatment, homelessness, threats to the public are a big barrier, so that's a big concern. Um, and of course, we want to keep the public as safe as possible. Uh, so that's a really important assessment that they're doing on scene. And then COVID-19, same, has been a, a barrier to all of our teams. We have recently changed the processes of CCSI, so we'd like to keep uh, evaluating how that's working out. We want them to definitely work more efficiently um, so that they can get through as many threats as they need to, but we also want to, to successfully be able to connect these individuals into services when they need to be. Um, of course, expanded, expanding the team with more care managers is only going to help us to see more patients and then also making this team sustainable as well. And those are our three uh, law enforcement related uh, mental health teams through the Crisis Collaborative. Uh, so, Greg, I think at this point we can open it up for questions. Great. Well, thank you. Um, a lot of questions have been coming in throughout the presentation. Uh, a number of those have been answered uh, during the course of the presentation in the Q&A box. I want to thank everyone, uh, the folks who submitted questions. There are some really good ones in here. I think uh, folks can likely see in the Q&A box the questions that, um, that have already been answered. Um, so I don't think we have any outstanding questions that haven't already been addressed. Um, so I think we're all on that. Um, does anyone uh, else have a comment or question? Greg, uh, this is Sarah. Can I elaborate? There was a question um, in the chat that um, I think maybe deserves a little bit more explanation and it was about diversion. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, there was a question um, and we could uh, Kelly, I don't know if you can go back to that slide, uh, where I spoke about facilities reporting their open um, status around uh, different bed categories for psychiatric treatment. And one of the questions was um, regarding um, why a specific facility was on diversion status. And I really didn't get to that when I talked earlier. Um, but facilities can either report that they are open or on diversion. And diversion meaning that um, they do not have a bed for that specific category at the time. And so they'll indicate diversion um, until they have a bed uh, that does become available and then they will open themselves back up to be able to receive uh, more patients. And so we monitor that, uh, those hours every month with each facility across the system. And we also look at when every uh, facility is on diversion for any given category, um, we make sure that um, we are then um, uh, spreading out um, the navigations because um, that really puts, you know, that really puts the patient in a bind when um, every facility is full. So our partners have committed to being able to accept patients, uh, what we call during a diversion override status. And so that means when everybody's full, everybody's open. And so everybody starts to work to try to make sure that um, we can um, open up capacity um, during that time. So we're typically not on diversion override for very long when everyone's full. Um, but it's something that's heavily monitored and every month we look at those numbers. So I hope that that answers that question. <laughs> and then Kylie and Ramon and Robert, I don't know if you guys have anything uh, you'd like to add to 
either SMART or PIC um, or CCSI, Kylie, I know you could, could be involved in either. Um, I think you covered it very well, but if anyone has a specific question, I'm more than happy to answer. There is another question that came in um, about sort of looking for advice on um, starting a program locally in, uh, in a, another part of the state. Um, would you have any recommendations or advice on how to get a, a crisis collaborative like this started? What, what are the, the seeds that need to be planted in order to get something like this up and running elsewhere? Yeah, I would say, um, and I don't know if they're referencing a specific program or just really the foundation of the collaborative, but some of the key um, components for us obvi obviously was collection of data to give us information around what is the problem. Um, and then having a shared, it, it's kind of a shared pain point is what I would like to call it, um, where everybody is invested and has some sort of um, skin in the game to uh, look towards supporting an effort like this. And if you look at ours, it definitely crossed over multiple um, agencies and different funders that were interested in, in supporting a, a kind of a foundational collaborative that then could generate more funding for other programming. So I would say data, I mean, you really can't do much on anecdotal um, information. Data kind of drives the decision making. Um, and then getting your relationships obviously built with um, your health, uh, your health systems and your uh, philanthropic organizations in your community. And um, I mean, we're we're a RAC. There's 22 RACs in San Antonio or in a, in Texas. So um, you know, partnering um, with those as well uh, might be a, a route uh, to try to support this effort. And then the different programming, we're happy to um, do um, kind of different calls with any of the people on the line if you are trying to set this up in, in your community we've done that before where we can do a little bit of a deeper dive in program development and how we uh, were able to work with our partners so um, please just reach out to us and i think our information should be on the last slide that has our email addresses and then do you want to address uh, they're asking to further explain the PES. um i've seen PES come up a number of times and i was wondering if you could explain this apologies if you did and i missed it yeah, um, so today was a highlight. Uh, we have more programs than what we talked about today. <laughs> today was a highlight really on crisis response um, as well as the partnership with multi-agencies, so law enforcement, um, uh, mobile integrated healthcare, um, and then cl the clinical team. We did not go into um, our other programs where we have transitional housing, and, and one of the ones that's asked about is um, psychiatric emergency services. Um, that program um, is an effort to be able to decompress um, emergency departments, and um, it kind of goes into those numbers that we talked about earlier um, when we were looking at ERs being um, full with people in uh, mental health crisis when really those um, individuals should have uh, direct access to um, uh, inpatient psychiatric treatment. So the PEZ creates a transfer uh, process, so um, if an indiv individual walks into a facility um, or is even navigated there or um, transported by EMS and um, later then cleared, they could be eligible for um, what's called a, um, it's, it's about a 48 hour observation type bed um, where we have multiple providers in the community that are offering that service to stabilize the patient and then determine if the patient um, is meeting criteria for a higher level of care to go inpatient or if they could actually be connected uh, back out to the community and, and to their outpatient uh, care. And so that's being operated. We, we do use um, the MedCom Foundation to do that. We have. Um, we actually have the local mental health authority inside of MedCom facilitating those transfers um, and um, working with all, all of our emergency departments uh, to be able to get individuals into, into care, into more specialized care uh, for that short period of time. So that, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, we, today was kind of a highlight and we're happy to answer any other questions related to other programs. Again, um, there's our information on the screen. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been really valuable. And, you know, I, if I could just make a quick statement on behalf of NAMI Texas about where we're coming from on this, you know, it is our firm belief that if individuals with mental health conditions are experiencing a crisis, they should have the opportunity to be diverted 
into treatments and services. And, and clearly there are many diversion options in this region of the state. I think what's, and, and that's not necessarily a unique thing. There are other communities in the state that have many diversion options as well. What makes this unique is the way that it's coordinated and the level of partnerships that exist between so many varying agencies. So, you know, my call to action as it, in terms of representing a statewide organization made up of individuals with mental health conditions and family members is that for anyone on this call who um, believes that their community needs something like the Southwest Texas Crisis Collaborative, please bring this webinar to the attention of decision makers in your community, whether they be providers, elected officials, uh, community groups, anyone who has the ability to move the ball forward on mental health care, please bring this webinar to their attention and let's plant the seeds for, for changes uh, in this uh, system and the delivery of care in your community so that individuals with mental health conditions have more options available to them for diversion when, when they find themselves experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, so this has been very powerful and, and I'm excited to see um, other communities look at this model uh, for potential replication. So uh, with that, I want to thank the, the, the panelists very much for, for providing this education and resources for us. And uh, I want to thank the uh, participants for taking your time for, for exposing yourself to this material. Um, thank you to our sponsors and to, uh, to NAMI San Antonio for, for all your support and partnership.